Hello everyone. Today I'll be talking about fluid resuscitation, which will span both the video series on fluids as well as the one on shock. There are three learning objectives here. First, to be able to identify which patients with shock or hypotension will benefit from IV fluid resuscitation. Second, to be able to choose an appropriate IV fluid. And last, to be able to list the main parameters used in determining whether a patient has been sufficiently resuscitated. Let's start by asking what is fluid resuscitation and who needs it? Fluid resuscitation is the rapid delivery of fluids to patients who have acutely impaired hemodynamics. Resuscitation fluids are given universally to patients in hypovolemic shock and lesser forms of dehydration, as well as almost all patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. When the clinician in the ER, ICU, or hospital wards is deciding whether or not a patient should receive IV fluids, conventionally, they decide to do so if the mean arterial pressure is less than 60 to 65 millimeters of mercury and or the CVP is less than 8, provided that there is no evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This is what I was taught to do as a medical student and what I practiced as a resident and for the first few years out of residency. It's still what a lot of students are taught. Unfortunately, this is not good practice. That's because neither MAP nor CVP are good predictors of which patients will benefit from IV fluids. In other words, a patient may be hypotensive and have a low CVP, but rapid administration of fluids does not necessarily improve their hemodynamics. This may be surprising and may even run counter to what you've been taught in the classroom or on the wards, so let me talk about just a couple pieces of evidence to support this. In 2007, a retrospective review was done of 150 volume challenges in 96 patients with septic shock in which the CVP and cardiac index was measured before a 500 milliliter bolus of hydroxyethyl starch that was given on the basis of various clinical signs of hypoperfusion. For those not familiar with the cardiac index, it's a measure of how much blood the heart pumps each minute corrected for the patient's body surface area. It's determined partly by the left ventricular preload, that is, how much blood is sitting in the LV at the end of diastole. After the bolus, the cardiac index was remeasured. If it increased by at least 15% after the fluid was given, the patient was considered to be a fluid responder. If not, the patient was a fluid non-responder. The initial CVPs were then compared between the two groups. So what did they find? Well, the investigators found that the CVPs in the responders and non-responders were statistically identical. Or put another way, the CVP had no predictive value in determining which patients would have improved cardiac index after administration of a fluid bolus. This is just one of the 43 studies, including about 1,800 patients, which were included in a 2013 meta-analysis in which CVP was investigated as a predictor of fluid responsiveness. I won't go through the analysis, but the paper's conclusion was this. There are no data to support the widespread practice of using CVP to guide fluid therapy. This approach to fluid resuscitation is without a scientific basis and should be abandoned. This is bringing us to a pretty big paradigm shift in the use of IV fluids in critically ill patients. The old paradigm was to evaluate a patient in shock and ask, is this patient hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic? Meaning, is the total blood volume too low, just right, or too high? We would base this question on a number of static measures such as CVP or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. In the new paradigm, instead we now ask, is this patient fluid responsive? And this question is based on dynamic measures in which we see how a physiologic parameter changes in response to some type of maneuver. The general concept of fluid responsiveness is simply that a fluid responsive patient will improve his or her oxygen delivery to peripheral tissues after being given fluids. More specifically, we can say that fluid responsiveness is present when either stroke volume, cardiac output, or cardiac index increases by at least 15% after receiving a 500 milliliter bolus. I mentioned that tests of fluid responsiveness are dynamic. What are some examples of that? Well, the appropriate tests depend upon whether the patient is spontaneously breathing or is being mechanically ventilated. In the spontaneously breathing patient, we can look at the change in pulse pressure in response to passive leg raise. That was explained in some detail in the video on recognizing shock subtype. 
We can also look at whether or not the IVC collapses with inspiration, as seen on bedside ultrasound, which was also explained in the aforementioned video. In patients who are sedated and mechanically ventilated, some even more accurate tests become options. There are many to choose from, but the most common are pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, and changes in aortic flow velocity. Dynamic tests of fluid responsiveness in ventilated patients rely on the cyclical changes in hemodynamics caused by the cycling of the ventilator. Here's how it works. High positive pressure during inspiration results in high pleural and transpulmonary pressures. This combination leads to four interdependent effects on the heart. Decreased RV preload, increased RV afterload, increased LV preload, and decreased LV afterload. The top two of these result in decreased RV stroke volume, and the bottom two result in increased LV stroke volume. These effects are at the most prominent at the end of inspiration when the airway pressure is greatest. Since the LV stroke volume is the primary determinant of the pulse pressure, that is the difference between the systolic and diastolic blood pressures, that also is at a maximum at the end of inspiration. Now once inspiration is over, it takes several cardiac cycles for the diminished RV stroke volume to result in decreased delivery of blood to the LV, where as a consequence of decreased myocardial stretch, the LV stroke volume will decrease. This results in a minimum LV stroke volume and minimum pulse pressure, both occurring near the end of expiration. To answer the question of whether or not a patient is likely to be fluid responsive, we need to compare the maximum and minimum. If these are significantly different, the patient is likely responsive. To see why that's the case, we'll need to visit the Frank-Starling relationship. If you've had basic cardiac physiology, you've seen this graph before. There's a couple of different variations in how the information is presented, but the most helpful one for us plots the LV stroke volume as a function of LV preload. The greater the preload, that is the greater the amount of blood volume present in the LV at end diastole, the greater the force of contraction, and thus the greater the subsequent stroke volume. However, notice how the line is not linear. As the preload increases higher and higher, the curve flattens out. Patients who are fluid responsive live on the so-called steep part of the curve. Look how the difference in preload between expiration and inspiration results in a notable change in stroke volume. However, if a patient has a higher preload to begin with, living on the so-called flat part of the curve, Modest differences in preload have negligible impact on stroke volume. So far, we've been discussing how to determine which patients will likely benefit from IV fluid resuscitation. Now let's switch to discussing what IV fluid to use. The first decision to make is whether to use crystalloid or colloid. Theoretically, as discussed in the previous videos in the IV fluid series, colloid should be superior to crystalloid as it has a greater tendency to stay intravascular. However, that's not the case in real life. This question was answered relatively definitively by a 2013 Cochrane review which examined mortality rates in 70 trials comparing various colloids and crystalloids. The trials contained a broad range of diagnoses from septic shock to massive burns and routine surgery. For the Cochrane review, each general class of colloid was grouped together. So first, we have the trials looking at albumin, which found that there was no difference in overall mortality. Then the trials looking at gelatins, which found the same. And the trials looking at dextrans, which still found no mortality difference. And last, the trials of hydroxyethyl starch. These found that crystalloid was actually superior. The authors make no attempt to explain the higher mortality with hydroxyethyl starch, but it's generally believed to be the consequence of renal dysfunction. This meta-analysis is not perfect. In my opinion, the most valid criticism is that even within the different colloid groups, there is still much variability in the intervention. For example, there are a dozen or more different forms of hydroxyethyl starch, each with a unique combination of chemical and pharmacologic properties. However, it is now widely accepted that in general, colloids offer no benefit over crystalloids for resuscitation. Given their decreased cost and increased availability, 
crystalloids are almost always favored over colloids. Antihydroxyethyl starch, in particular, is considered contraindicated in shock due to increased mortality and increased risk of acute kidney injury. So that answers the crystalloid versus colloid question. But what about the different types of crystalloid? That is, normal saline versus balanced solutions such as lactated ringers. There's a common observation that internists seem to prefer saline, while surgeons and intensivists prefer balanced solutions. But there's just a little bit more to the story here. Normal saline, which some argue is not very normal at all, can lead to a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis of uncertain significance. In addition, there is some evidence that normal saline may increase the risk of renal dysfunction in patients with shock, specifically by inducing renal vasoconstriction. In 2012, there was published a prospective open-label trial involving 1,500 critically ill patients with a variety of diagnoses. In the first half of the study conducted in 2008, the clinicians treating these patients were limited in the IV fluid they could prescribe to chloride-rich fluids such as normal saline and chloride-rich colloids. In the second half of the study conducted in 2009, with very narrow exceptions, the clinicians could use only chloride-limited fluids such as lactated ringers and a balanced solution called plasma light. What was found that was that the number of patients who required renal replacement therapy, that is dialysis, was significantly higher in the chloride-rich 2008 group. This study is far from perfect. For one, it was not blinded, and in fact wasn't randomized, strictly speaking. But it's the best clinical evidence to date of the possible benefit of balanced solutions over normal saline. I've found that some individual clinicians are strong advocates for balanced solutions based on their theoretical physiological advantages, the aforementioned trial, as well as smaller trials of more limited scope. However, prospective trials showing mortality benefit of balanced solutions do not yet exist. Until more trials supporting balanced solutions over normal saline are published, routine use of normal saline for resuscitation is still acceptable given its strong historical precedent and the lack of conclusive evidence of harm. In my own practice, as part of a desire to provide trainee autonomy, I tend to default to resident preference. At my institution, that preference has typically been normal saline. After all, I attend on an internal medicine service. However, if I was practicing by myself on a non-teaching service, I would probably rely more heavily on LR, except for patients with very specific conditions favoring NS, such as hyponatremia. So we've tackled what fluids to give, but how should they be administered? It may seem obvious, but IV fluids in shock should always be given in boluses rather than via maintenance fluids, which will be the topic of the final video in the IV fluids series. How large those boluses should be depends upon the patient. For patients in shock and requiring IV fluids who are without a history of either CHF or end-stage renal disease, one to two liters at a time is typically ordered. The Influential Surviving Sepsis Campaign specifically recommends 30 milliliters per kilogram of crystalloid fluid as an initial fluid challenge. In patients with a history of mild to moderate CHF, which is admittedly very vaguely defined, or a history of end-stage renal disease, I advocate for 500 to 1,000 milliliters at a time. And for those with a history of severe CHF, just 250 milliliters at a time. The recommendations for those last two categories are just my opinion and are not from formal guidelines. Remember that patients should be reassessed after each fluid bolus until the shock is resolved. Now, this does not mean that patients with CHF who present with septic or hypovolemic shock won't require as much fluids as a patient without CHF, but rather it means you will get into more trouble if you accidentally overshoot fluid therapy. So in a previously healthy patient presenting with septic shock, you might order 2 liters of fluid and reassess in 15 minutes, whereas in the patient with advanced heart failure, you might order just 250 milliliters of fluid and reassess every 2 minutes. But the total fluid given could end up being the same in the end. So now that we are bolusing fluid, we should decide what venous access we should use. The common choice is a peripheral IV. Peripheral IVs come in a variety of sizes, from a very large 14 gauge to a tiny 23 gauge.
that can be placed in just about anywhere. Another option is a triple lumen central venous catheter, also known as a central line, which is a long catheter usually fed into either the internal jugular, subclavian, or femoral vein. The lumen of these lines are subdivided into three separate lumens, which do not communicate with one another, and which empty into the venous system at different spots along its length. One could also use something called an introducer, which in the U.S. is commonly referred to by the brand name Cordis. This is also a central line, but instead of being long and subdivided into separate lumens, it is relatively short and has a single very wide lumen. One last option which I don't have pictured is an intraosseous line that is inserted into the bone marrow, usually of a long bone. This is usually reserved for small children in whom IV access can be challenging to obtain, or in the crashing patient in whom there is not time to establish IV access, as an intraosseous line is typically quicker. So how do we choose between those options? Is one kind of access best for delivering fluids as rapidly as possible? Well, it turns out that physics gives us the answer, specifically something called Poissier's Law. This law from fluid mechanics states that the resistance to fluid flow through a tube is proportional to the length of the tube and inversely proportional to the radius to the fourth power. In other words, small changes in the width of the line makes huge changes in the resistance. So the best line would be something that is short and large bore, and the worst is one that is long and thin. So here's a rough breakdown of various options. The introducer is the best. If one uses a pressure bag around the bag of IV fluids, a liter can be delivered in about a minute. Introducers can take time to place, however, so the next best option is a large peripheral IV. Then a standard triple lumen central line. Then a small peripheral IV. And finally, the worst axis for rapid fluid resuscitation is a pick line, which I didn't mention previously because you should never be using it in shock. It's just too slow. So now how do we know when a patient has been adequately resuscitated? That is, how do we know when it's time to back off on the fluids? And why is that critical? Well, it's critical to know when to back off because patients with shock who receive the greatest amount of fluids have worse mortality after controlling for confounding factors. The primary mechanism for this is believed to be the contribution of excess fluid to the development of pulmonary edema. The evidence of adequate resuscitation is typically given as mean arterial pressure of at least 65 millimeters of mercury, CVP of 8 to 12, a urine output of at least 0.5 milliliters per kg per hour, central venous O2 sat of at least 70%, normalized lactate levels if initially elevated, and normalized mental status if abnormal to begin with. These are the common metrics used in practice, the first five of which are taken directly from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign's guidelines on the management of severe sepsis and septic shock. However, remember from the beginning of the video that studies have shown that CVP in particular is a poor predictor of fluid responsiveness. Despite an earnest search for one, I am unable to offer an explanation as to why the Surviving Sepsis Campaign still recommends using CVP as a guide here. Finally, although I see this used on a fairly regular basis, a patient's heart rate is not a reliable indicator of volume status. While it's true that hypovolemia usually leads to tachycardia, there are many, many other things that do also. These include pain, anxiety, fever, drug intoxication or withdrawal, medication side effects, primary arrhythmias, and even congestive heart failure. And patients can have a failure to mount a tachycardic response to true hypovolemia due to concurrent use of beta blockers or non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem. Bottom line, never use a patient's heart rate to impact the decision as to whether IV fluids should be administered. So we're almost at the end. It's time to summarize. Dynamic tests of fluid responsiveness are preferred over traditional criteria such as low CVP as factors when deciding whether to give IV fluids. Crystalloid is almost always preferred over colloid. In most circumstances, there is no proven advantage of either normal saline or LR over the other, although LR may lead to less AKI. IV fluids should be given rapidly in discrete boluses 
with frequent reassessment for signs of both adequate as well as excessive resuscitation. And finally, the best venous axis for rapid IV fluid infusion is one that is short and large bore, such as an introducer, or as a closed second choice, a large 14 or 16 gauge peripheral IV. That concludes this video on IV fluid resuscitation. I hope you found it interesting and useful. The next video in the fluid series will be on maintenance fluids, and the next one in the shock series will be on pressors.